All right, everybody, today is a old Ford carburetor day. There's a lot of people bringing out the old Fords and um, just trucks and cars and all that. And this carburetor was real common all the way from the 60s up to the late 70s or early 80s. And um, I'm going to be going through this carburetor. Uh, and I'll explain some of the systems and how it works. That'll help clarify any issues if you're working on some of this old stuff yourself and you're trying to diagnose what's going on with it. This is off of a 1976 Ford car with a 302. I want to say it's off of Granada. The guy brought me the carburetor, so I don't have the vehicle, but the, the E on the on the tag here, this E on this tag usually stands for, for like a car. And just to give you a little update, how this works, you'll see a D6 and Ford used those two letter, those date codes those two letters and that or that letter and that number is a date code that Ford used from 1950 all the way up till well, some of the stuff nowadays and it goes like this this will help you working on it goes this part number goes on any engine part I swear to you like if you take a motor part in a Ford and you look at the first two digits it's going to give you a date code so letter let's just go from the beginning here so when they started this in 1950, this, this letter right here, D, would be a B. So B is 1950, and the next digit after that would be a decade, in, or the, the year in that decade. So, so B would be 1950, so C would be 1960, D would be 1970. And we want to know what year that is, so that's 1976. That's what year that this tag stands for. Now if you look at Ford part numbers like taillights, engine parts, crankshafts, anything that's got that first two digits all the way up until conservatively the late 2000s, 2010, you can date code that part. That will help you when you're working on Ford stuff and you want to know what you have. If you're looking at old small block, you don't know if it's a 302 or a 289 because it's partly there, you know, you can go by those first letters and know what year that was and kind of get an idea of what was produced in those years. That really helps me a lot. So we'll go back to that. That's a D1976. Started in 1950 with the letter B. So anyways, I've already done a little bit taking it apart and I stopped myself. This would be a great video for people to watch because there's so many people wanting to work on carburetors and being just completely baffled by the process. They know that it works, but they just don't know how. So I've already removed a lot of the Ford carburetors. You need to remove this stud right here out of the top. Some of you don't. This one was one of them, but I'll go ahead and just take it out anyway to get it out of the way so that it's not going to hold it. And I remove all the bolts off the top. So I sort of work my way from the top down. Being I've done that, I've already got some of it loose here. Um, and we'll just flip this over like this right here because I don't want to bend that. That right there is a, is a bend for the bolt. And, uh, So when you're finding carburetor kits, it makes it really easy when you, use it, when you know kind of what year that is. And better yet, like if you don't have that tag, if you don't have this tag for the carburetor, and you know that you know what uh, the date codes are, then you can kind of give the people at the parts place an idea where to start. You can say, man, I believe, let's, let's go with a D7, that'd be 77. Go for a kit for that. And even though that's a car or a truck number, that E on there, you still use a lot of those parts. You can make something work. It's not a whole lot of these carburetors. Thank goodness Ford made these. They made them real simple. This is called a needle valve and a float. That right there, this is a needle valve right here. Let me get my screw. That's a needle valve right there. And, and what it does is as the, as the gas goes into the carburetor via where it comes in right here from the fuel line as it's pumped into the motor, pumped into from the fuel pump, it pumps into here, it fills the bowl up, the bowl will actually fill up to move this float much like in a toilet. And what happens is, is it stops the flow of the fuel off at a, at a strategic location so it doesn't overfill the carburetor and run down into the throat. Fuel level is real critical because of the fact that the carburetor is reactive to how much fuel is in this bowl as to how much velocity of air it takes to make proper fuel mixture. So if you've got a float that's too high, even though it's not flooding the motor, you can get poor fuel consumption because you're you're using more fuel than what air is necessary because the carburetor is not jetted for that high of a fuel level. And that's all determined by the jets right here at the bottom. These little openings right here allow for, for a calculated restrictive airflow, or not airflow, but fuel flow, I'm sorry. 
And what that does is, is you can change these out and the fuel level will react different to the amount of air that goes by. And what happens right here, this is called an air horn. The air horns are what actually let air travel by here and these are poured in fuel. When I take this out, you'll see rods that go down here and, the, and it actually levels off gas on the other side of the carburetor up to these little pieces that when I come out, I'll show you. Well, what happens there is just like if you were a child, remember your kid or you used to take a, uh, you would take a, you'd be at a, at a fast food restaurant and you would have a drink with a straw in it and you'd be funny and you'd want to blow across the straw and then drink would come out and spray whoever was in the front of the face because they were right in front of you. And it was always an entertaining thing to do. If you haven't done that, try that sometime. Sit at the table and blow across the straw while it's in your drink and watch the drink come straight up the straw and out the end of it and to whoever's face is in front of it. What's happening there is you're creating a lower pressure around the area where the air is flowing and that allows for the outside air pressure, which we have outside air pressure, and it changes from altitude. Lower altitude is higher atmospheric pressure. But anyways, we won't go into that and I want to confuse you, but you'll actually create a, an area where there's a low pressure right here and the atmospheric pressure can push down on the gas and make it actually kind of feed itself out. And then what these things do is just kind of provide an area for the fuel to come out and just evenly disperse amongst the venturi is what we'll call that, or the barrel. We'll call it the venturi because we're being real technical today. And then, and of course that's all controlled by the butterfly. I'm gonna try to open it here. You can probably see where I've opened those up. Those butterflies are direct linked to the engine allow a certain amount of air to go by depending upon how far you open your throttle right here. This little thing on the front, this little thing on the front is called an accelerator pump. And what that does is, is it's actually, it's kind of, you'll see this vein that runs right through here. There's a little bitty hole right there. This is a one-way valve down below it, this little neoprene thing. We'll get to that in a minute. But gas will go in here and it gets, when you squash down on this, it squirts it into this up this little thing and then out these two little squirters. So at the end of the process of rebuilding this carburetor, what I'll end up doing is pumping the gas a few times, filling this bowl up and I'm able to check the boosters. So, and this, an accelerator pump is there to provide fuel under low vacuum situations where you're getting the engine up to RPM. It helps kind of give it a surge of fuel to get everything rolling. So we'll get it tore into it and a little more explanation, be back. So into the teardown procedure, just to be a quick rundown, this is how I usually do it, and it works fine for me. I'll, I'll remove this little clip right here. I just, usually I can just take my screwdriver and pop it up. I know I'm doing this with my one hand, so bear with me. I'll just pop this up right here. This will slide off. I'll make sure I look and see what hole that that's in. There's little multiple holes. And 90% of the time you can go in that top hole. When you change that hole, it just changes the throw of that rod, but you just put it back where it came from. And if you don't know, always just put it in the top hole. It'll be fine. I'll remove these four little quarter inch bolts. On the assembly of this, this needs to be done by hand. You don't tighten these with any kind of power tools. These are real small bolts on aluminum threads and they don't have to be torqued very much to work. You just gotta get them snug. If you over torque it, you're gonna bend these ears and deflect this whole piece and you'll have to take a flat file and machine it back down to get it to work and it just makes for a crappy installation so be real careful with these when going back so let me get this back apart and I'll be right back okay so we've got the accelerator pump removed and, and what will come out will be a little spring it'll come out fast you won't even see it come out uh, it's not under a lot of pressure at all you can squeeze it but what you want you want to note the position and it's real simple this spring is going to go, you do not want it sitting, you don't want it like this. It doesn't go like that. That's that's not good. Don't do that. Put it like this. It goes around that little check valve because if you flip it around the wrong way, then your check valve is not going to work properly. So it does not go like that. It goes like that. Put that spring in there just like that. Okay? And that spring's job is to help return this diaphragm. It pushes this back. It keeps that ready and loaded so every time you throttle into it, you get a little bit of fuel to help pick up and go. Because what happens is under, when you throttle into this until RPMs come up, you're gonna lose engine vacuum. Anything that's gas powered does that. 
so you have accelerator pump squirts a little bit of raw fuel just to kind of like get things picked up and running. All right, I'll be back again. We're going to tear it to a little bit more, and I'll explain to you a little as I go. Thank you. Okay, so, oh, my heater cut off. Yay. Okay, so, whip it. All right. Okay, so, to remove this right here, we're just going to take this. I got a, these are real handy. If you can find a set of screwdrivers that have a real wide end for carburetors, this is so handy. We'll just remove the air horn and the emulsion tubes which is all assembly. It's pretty simple. There's a strainer on these, or they should be. Somebody's taking it out. Uh, okay, Wait, let me look and see. It might be on the bottom of this. This is pretty simple. You just carefully apply a little bit of pressure. Now, sometimes these things don't want to come out, but this one here is going to come out. Okay. When you pull these out, be careful not to bend these here. And if you've got a carburetor that's sat with ethanol fuel in it or water in it, I don't know what it is, but it'll split those little brass emulsion tubes. And that affects how the carburetor works. I have had luck with going in there and clamping them back down and taking a soldering, a big soldering iron and soldering those brass emulsion tubes back together. But uh, that's um, if you're not that advanced and you, you know some of these parts are around, you can find them on eBay. You know, always helps if you ever see any, if you're a dude that's messing with old carburetors or old vehicles, you see a carburetor laying somewhere, you pick it up and you put it in the junk pile because you're going to want that carburetor later. Keep it in the dry. So, um, and then, so let's see here. So the accelerator pump used to pump fuel whenever the engine's in a low vacuum, when you hit the accelerator, when you want to, fuel's supposed to squirt, you have a, a rod that goes down. And then behind this rod, there's a little bitty ball bearing. And that's one of your other check valves. And usually I just go ahead and I just tip it over over my parts tray like this right here. There's the little check valve bearing. That's a check valve. That's what that is. All right. So we're getting there. I've got a little bit longer wide flathead screwdriver and that little notch. I cut that notch in there to work on Chrysler carburetors. If anybody's worked on the old teapots, the, uh, the power valve that's in the bottom there to get it out. It's got a raised section on it and to keep from messing that up, uh, I took a little flat file and ground that groove in it so I could clear that little if if uh if Claremont's classic garage is watching he'll know what I'm talking about he's a Dodge guy he's a cool dude if you ever checking out that so to remove these here I'm gonna have to put the fire in it here and I've got I'm gonna get these out I want to get these little uh these jets out here so I'm going to put the phone down stop it for a second and I'll be right back properly remove these jets you really like i can't recommend the wide screwdriver enough one that fits in there completely clears the jet that goes on both sides because if it doesn't if it if part of your screwdriver is stuck down in here and you try to turn it you're going to break the head of the jet off you want to you want a screwdriver that will will grab both corners real well let's we'll take those out okay next up we'll be pulling the needle valve out there should be a strainer on this as well some people don't put them back but that needle valve should have a strainer on it okay be right back flat oh like I say, can't recommend my big wide screwdriver enough. That one there is just almost big enough. But I have this one here, which I'll be using, which will definitely get on both sides of that needle valve without messing anything up. May have to use that again. So we don't want to mess that needle valve up. Okay. Right over. And just to clarify a few other neat things, you don't need to take all this choke lever stuff off. You're just overdoing it. There's no reason to. You can you can put the carburetor in the dip. I put the whole thing in there and not hurt anything. I pulled that uh Choke pull off. I've, t I've taken that off because it's got a diaphragm in there. But uh, other, or if you just want to be, you know, just you know, wor you're worried that much, you can just usually tip it in the can and tip the end of it up and just set it in there. And, do and you really, all you really need to do is get that cleaner into this section here, where you'll clean out the uh, little portholes for your air fuel mixture. Air fuel mixture is what sets the idle on the well, not the idle speed, but when the vehicle is idling, and you and you notice it running rich. Or or something where it's not idling very well. Typically, if these screws are, are if it was running right before and nobody's moved these screws, then you've got a problem with the carburetor. There's trash in it. But just for for the heck and sake of it, you know, when we set this thing up, you know, you want to be uh, you you would you would want to get the engine up to operating temperature, and you would set these screws based on how it sounds. You would listen to the sound of the motor. And I don't have the vehicle here, 
So I won't be able to do that part of it, but I'll have more carburetor work coming in and I'll show you how to do a set, set the mixture screws. But a quick reference so that, you know, it kind of gives you a base starting point. I, I've messed with enough of these to know that most Fords, you know, just two or two and a half and you're good. A lot of carburetors, you two, two and a half turns from, you turn them all the way in. You want to turn them into where they bottom out, but not be just barely just turn it. You don't crank these screws at all. Is where you feel it stop, you stop right there, but you count the turns going in. You, you kind of get a mental note of the screwdriver or put you a little piece of white paint or white out on this corner so you can count how many times you turn. And you would, uh, that way you would know where to put the jet back. So we'd go, it's hard to do this with the phone, so bear with me. It'd be one, two, so that was in a little bit. We almost had almost two, that was one and three quarter. So that's close enough. We can back it out two turns, it'll run. And, I, and the customer is sort of handy. If nothing else, it'll make it here where he can let me set it up. So anyhow, we'll go ahead and get, we need to get these out. I'm going to take these out. So I'm going to count the turns on this other one so I know where to put them back. And then we'll take this cover off for the power valve and I'll do an explanation about what its job is here in just a minute. So let me get these out. We'll get this off with just the four screws and we'll have access to the power valve. Okay, all right. All righty, so here we are at the power valve. A power valve can have different numbers on it if you buy an aftermarket. And that number is an actual registration of what the weight of the spring is. And I'll show you the spring in a second. And it's reactive to not just positive vacuum, but fluctuation in vacuum. So when you throttle into a motor with the air filter off, you can hear it make a noise like a moan. Brrr, you hear that brrr. Well, that's a pulse. You're hearing a pulse because you don't have a steady flow of vacuum because the valve's opening up and RPMs, there's a fluctuation in the steady flow of air going into that carburetor, causing some harmonics. So to take advantage of those harmonics, with the fluctuation of vacuum, what they've done is, let's see if I can get my light here. You can see, you'll see a little hole right there. This hole right here is ported to get over here on this side. We're pretty smart. It's ported. You see that little hole down here at the bottom right there. Okay. That's actually ported to direct manifold vacuum. You can see right here, you see the little openings allowing vacuum to be applied to this part of the carburetor. Well, it's, it's vacuum, but under acceleration, it's pulsing until a certain RPM to where the flow starts to become one, do one direction. And that pulsing starts to activate this diaphragm on the, on this end of your power valve. Okay. I'm going to get it out real quick, and then you'll see a little bit more about what's happening. I've got to find my big wrench here. Let's see. It's a one inch, and I have a, a really cool old Craftsman wrench that's been here since I was here 20 years ago, which was 20 years old then. Anyways, so counterclockwise, turns it loose, regular counterclockwise threads. And, and so you'll see the spring. That spring is allowing return of that diaphragm. So when it has fluctuation in one direction that's going to move this diaphragm you see it's sealed off on this one side because if you'll notice right here you've got direct access to the uh to the ports on the um on your on your jet section we're like in other words where it actually goes right to the emulsion tubes and that's something that we'll be cleaning out and i'm going to show you a trick for that this carburetor is in really good shape by the way so this is not going to be a hard build at all it's not all messed up like i've seen them so where I just shown you on the bottom of the, in that hole there that goes right to these holes, which goes right to these holes. And that creates a pulsing effect, which then kind of like creates an, a push. So under when you don't have a steady flow of natural va vacuum, creating that one direction flow, so atmospheric pressure can push down, and allow fuel to come out to your nodular jets. That power valve is going to pump a little bit of fuel as it's kind of fluctuating. And the reason why you would have different weight springs is because some engines had big old cams in them. And so to keep from the, just the idle alone, activating this power valve and causing the engine to flood under idle because of the inconsistent vacuum, you would put a heavier duty uh, power valve on it. Or if you've got an engine that has a uh, low vacuum, like, uh, like some motors, like, a, like the old 400 EMs, they don't have a lot of, the vacuum is weird on those, man. They use a real late cam time. And so the vacuum is a little weak. Use a lightweight spring and it kind of gives you a little more fluctuation, allowing for more fuel flow to help the engine pick up and go. But you don't want to go too light because you, you'll end up having, you know, a flooding issue. So anyhow, 
that's what the power valve does. What happens when a power valve malfunctions being the fact that it's got, it's threaded into the bottom of this bowl right here. There's gas sitting right on top of this diaphragm. What can happen if you, if you throttle this thing down and it spits back through the carburetor, you get an extremely high positive manifold vacuum, way positiver than the 14 or 20 inches that it's used to having under normal vacuum. You might see 100 inches or 200 inches of positive pressure. That will actually blow out that little diaphragm. It'll it'll blow that little that little uh, polypropylene thing or whatever that thing's made out of nylon neoprene. It'll blow that out and cause a small fracture in it, and then gas will actually leak down into the the wrong side of this to where there's supposed to be just vacuum, not all that fuel, and dump into the motor and get into the gas, get gas into oil. I mean and cause it where you have to hold it wide open whenever it sits for a little bit or like if you go like the next day and it's out of fuel and you've got to dump fuel in the bowl to get it to crank well that power valve is allowing fuel to leak by that power valve due to a, a ruptured diaphragm for whatever reason either due to age or a, a real hard spit back through the throttle body or the carburetor that's why you see a lot of hollies they run these hollies will use these same power valves and they have a thing called blowout protection which is no more than just a a ball bearing put in place so when you get positive manifold pressure the ball bearing stops the hole up and keeps some too much pressure going by and it's only a 50 50 shot whether or not it blows that power valve out so that's what it does and that's what its job is so we'll get a little further into this and i'll do some more video okay everybody so back again real quick i want to thank all the people trying to save america out there too by the way We're working hard so to clean ports and small little sections in the carburetor you know a lot of people i've seen try to use copper wire but it's just real flimsy and, it, and then i've seen it actually break off and not be able to be got out and end up ruining the carburetor because they stopped the whole port up with a piece of copper wire they were running in and out with a pair of pliers so my answer to that is is this is a cable this is an old hood cable um that i pulled out of the the, the sheath and i unraveled it and if you've ever messed with any like stainless steel cable, you realize just how tough one little strand is. Um, if you don't have access to that bicycle cable, any kind of stranded cable that you can get out of the sheath that's made out of that stainless, it's got a tensile strength that allows it to be able to be flexed and moved around without breaking. It's got it's just made out of this, this awesome metal. Um, and you can it's so small, it gets so small that I'm able to actually go into really small jets. Like if I'm working on ATV carburetors and those little bitty jets get stopped up, there's a really cool trick for that. And you're going to laugh when I tell you this, but my wife, she got mad at me one day because she was like, what are you doing? Anyhow, uh, I'm boiling some stuff in on the stove, man. You can take and put a carburetor part in the hot into water and just turn it on and let it boil. You know, you know, not, I wouldn't boil it completely to death, but you know, you can actually that brass, it'll be okay. It won't melt. And it really heats up that varnish that gets built up from a carburetor sitting for a long time. And you can work this through those holes that you normally would never have a shot at. So think about that next time. If you have a wood stove in the shop, you can throw some water in a pot. You can, you can throw, you really technically, you could throw this whole carburetor in there and boil this carburetor for about 10 minutes under a, a good steady boil. And when you pulled it out, it'd be just clean as all get out. I mean, you wouldn't want to like, you know, water gets pretty hot so you wouldn't want to warp the carburetor just you know under no, under a, a, a controlled circumstance I, you can do that you can take jets and put in there and heat them up let the water boil on it and that just softens up all that stuff so i'm going to take this little cable and i'm going to go through all the little openings that i see and this is the trick and they're so easy to overlook but carburetors have many little openings there's two of them right here at the end of this air horn and those often get overlooked these holes are critical to the fuel balance that comes in this side of the carburetor. So, you know, when the fuel travels from the bowl over here to this section as it sits in its normal level, these little bleeder holes are so, just as an air bleed, they're very critical. You've got to clean those out. You've got to clean all the varnish that gets in around these little things here out because that's part of the air supply for those, for those ports. Uh, this needs to be moving freely up and down. This right here is reactive to engine vacuum. It's actually ported right down through the bottom of the carburetor and gets engine vacuum from the engine right in this hole right here. So that's some of the things you just need to clean. It's real simple. So you don't run that wire through there. Um, you want a can of brake cleaner or carburetor cleaner that you want to run through there and like blow out. Then you need it. And it really helps to have a little bit of access to some pressurized air. Because then after that, you're going to run air pressure through here. Uh, blow all these ports out. You want to, and there's, ooh, 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 your most critical part of this carburetor, and it's so overlooked. Oh, it's so overlooked. So, so far as like having a great idle and good part throttle 
operation and all these all these carburetors you, these little holes here these holes here are where the mixture screws come out and you have idle mixture these holes right here are actually what allow the vehicle to come off of part throttle operation and smooth transition to the air being pulled by your horns on the that would normally be in here but i've got to take it out so if you really want to go in there and take that wire and you want to run it through these holes right here and they go in at about a 45 degree angle so you'll run the wire through the holes you'll actually see you'll see the wire come up through these little parts right here those little you'll see your wire if you take a light and look when you get it through there it'll be sticking out right here when you come in from the power valve side you'll see your wire come through these little holes i've even seen it sent through right here that's how you know you get it opened up blow all that out real good don't want any varnish in there um, don't want any trash in here just clean that out real good the best you can you can use stuff like this right here let me get here real quick uh, a good good old can of this stuff right here is real good for, for setting you don't have to use that container you can get two cans put in a bigger container so your carburetor will fit which i have done over here that big white container is full of it and it's wide enough to where it fits in there until we're getting that out. So I'm gonna soak the carburetor for a little bit, then I'll blow it out real good with the air hose. This vehicle right here, while I'm letting it soak, this vehicle right here is gonna get timing chains. I gotta put timing chains, I gotta pull the oil pan off and get all the stuff that fell down in the oil pan to stop the strainer up. This it came in running, so that's a good thing. But she's rattling real bad on the front, so I'll fix that too. And I'm waiting on my cylinder heads to come back from the tour so I took them apart a week or so ago. But uh, for the meantime, I'll be cleaning this carburetor, letting it soak, and I'll get back to you, and we'll send this video out. I really thank everybody, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll assemble it together. I'll be back in a little bit. Thank you. We're going with the uh, assembly procedure. What I've done is I'm starting from the bottom up. And I said something before about this number, but I'll point it out again. This number on this power valve says 6.5. You see it at the top. I've got it right here at the top. That's the number that gives you a an ideal of the weight of that spring right there and if you wanted a lighter weight spring for a less vacuum operation you go to a four five or three five if you wanted a heavier spring for more vacuum that you if you've got better back manifold vacuum or stocker applications you'd go to a seven five <clears throat> six five is a good all-around use and i'm using this gasket which is the round gasket right here instead of that triangle gasket that was used on the original power valve or the one that's removed get it in focus here so what what it does is a triangle shaped gasket we'll get into those man my camera does not want to focus today there it goes it gets into those little holes right there and that's where the fuel is pulled in and dispersed back up it pulls in from the middle and disperses back out and so with the round gasket it actually goes perfectly around the little step you'll see a little step on the power valve be mindful of that right there and the power valve like i said before is used to just kind of like pulse fuel when you have a a pulse in your intake vacuum signal due to acceleration from the low rpm valve the valves open things change but you don't have a consistent vacuum flow yet so that valve takes advantage of that and kind of pumps a little fuel and gets the annular boosters or nozzle nozzles to to work in the air horn so we'll take a wrench and we'll tighten that down then we'll put our cover back over it and we'll use the little this little gasket here and we'll be we don't need to tighten the bolts all to heck um make sure when you use a gasket that it doesn't cover up this back this little hole right here because it actually uses a signal from out here to operate this side of it fuel should never be on this side of the valve if it is you've got a bad power valve if you, if you remove that cover and there's gas on that side of the company take it out and gas dumps out or you can see where gas has been in there then this diaphragm is ruptured and that power valve is bad and it doesn't take long one good spit back through a carburetor and you've took out a good power valve so i'll be back in a little bit oh this is going to be hard to do with with one hand so i'm going to try it like this i'm going to set the phone down i'll just give you a little quickie with my cable in action here so i'll take this cable and uh and I just use it to run through the holes like that there. It works so good for that. That's that, uh, matter of fact, it's a piece of a hood cable. And I run through these holes and clean these out. I get, I'll try to go as deep as I can with it, but when I've penetrated fully and we'll go through these little bleed holes right here. 
Got to make sure you get, this is where you don't want to get the wire stuck. That's where I've seen wire get stuck. People going in there and break off. And the, you want to twist this around and kind of work it a little bit so you know you got the, the fuzz gone so that it'll actually clean out. And uh, then I'll take my little brake cleaner with the with the rubber hose and I'll hit this here and hit this here and the gas will shoot out here, here, and here. And I want to make sure it does. I want to shoot there and make sure I get it coming through. Um, I'll skip the step, but I'm just kind of cleaning some stuff up in the process. This will be the cap that goes on a right tier for that's the housing that goes over top of the power valve. So I'll be back in a second again. I tend to make it a habit to put the, the mixture screws in on the bottom side last. I don't want to put this cover or anything on because when you're working with that big old wrench, it's easy to, uh, to loosen that power valve and go into the side of one of these metering jets for the idle mixture and bend it. So I don't do that. So I'm going all the way in. Okay, I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna go out two turns. Okay, and then we'll go all the way in with this one. And out one, two. We'll go two and a quarter. Seems like he always does that when I just went out on that on the uh, driver's side of that carburetor. Anyway, okay, so we've got that done. So like using air hose and everything to blow stuff out is a really good idea, but just to make sure uh, you always want to not do that while your power valve's in there, just to let you know, because you don't want to blow a lot of pressure on one side of that power valve. So be careful. Loop the power valve in last. I've already done the liberty of blowing out all the little holes here and um, all that, but I figured I'd tell you now, better late than never. Just always do that because you don't want to put air pressure on that power valve. Okay, all right. A little further along in construction, we've got the mixture screws in. They were pretty clean. I ran a little wire through the hole. Some people go over and beyond the duty and use a wire brush and make them all shiny. Okay, if you want to do that, that's fine. But uh, there was that's just normal looking right there. There's no sense wearing off the brass. So, okay. And then I'll be putting, we'll, we'll do this now. Uh, I'll find the, I'm always a stickler for saving old parts on these carburetors because you just never know what you're going to run into. But uh, so anyway, so I've got the, this always goes first as far as the accelerator pump is concerned. That one always goes first. You'll put that, that goes in the very center hole. And then, let's see here, then your little weight rod they call it this sits over top of that little check ball and keeps a little bit of weight on it that's all that thing does it's a weight rod just something just to kind of keep that thing from bouncing around that thing just sits on top of it we'll got to locate the correct gasket for our air horn right here it's ready to go on this is the correct gasket for our air horn and you can see that there's a dent or a divot on one side so we want to mind that make sure that goes over it make sure it doesn't cover up any holes some of these were a little bit different, but most of them are all the same. You want to make sure that that's lined up properly. I'm using one hand here, so I'll line it up properly. We'll reinstall it over that. We'll put our bolt that goes over or screw or hold down. Next, we'll be installing the needle valve in the float, and I'll show you a quickie on how to set the float properly. Okay, so the original float, you want to look at your float. Even though it's not brass or whatever, it doesn't, you know, they don't quote unquote get a hole in it. Sometimes the material itself can break down, especially with ethanol fuel. And as you can see, you see that hole and then the float. I don't know what caused that hole in the float, but uh, that right there, it's a, and it looks, and these things will get porous. And I'll give you a good scenario of a porous uh synthetic float like this you'll take it out you'll work on the carburetor you'll set the float level what will happen is this thing will dry out sitting on the bench you'll set it down you might set it in the sun somewhere the gas will dry out of it and you won't see anything wrong with the carburetor it'll be perfectly set fine the float will be perfectly set you'll crank it up and it'll run great but then after it sits there for 30 minutes to an hour and it starts to soak the fuel back up in this porous material then the float becomes heavy and now it starts to flood and you can't never get it to set right and then you're 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 back into it again you're like what did i do wrong so you'll take the carburetor back apart you'll set the float back on the workbench 
or in the sun, whatever you're doing, and it'll dry back out, and you'll put it back together. It'll run great. You're excited. You're ready to go full wheeling, and then it starts flooding again, and then you're, you know, you'll repeat this in time until you figure out that this float just sits there and gets heavy, and it'll dry out when it's sitting on the workbench. So let me save you the headache. So if you're able to, and this, you know, if you don't know anything about this carburetor, how it was working before, then you need to replace the float. Okay. Alrighty, so setting the float level is pretty, pretty simple. Thank goodness. They give you one of those little, they give you one of these here. Look at my YouTube video. What's up? That's, look at that guy right there. Yeah. Alrighty. <laughs> got a flag on the back of it right here. A different phone there. Yeah, yeah, this is my new phone. My wife got me this. Oh, by the way, my wife got me a new phone case for my phone. It's American flag. Y'all can't see it, but I can. So we're, we're doing a YouTube video of building a carburetor. That's what we're doing right now. We're on, we're not live right oh. now, but we're shooting it right now, and you get to be in it. Woohoo! All right. You're looking good, yeah. by the way. Thank you. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so. Look, look good me, 49. Here, here yeah, push that float good. down right there. Huh? Push that float down right there. This, oh, yeah, there you go. Right here. There you go. He's a newbie, y'all. Yeah, I'm learning. <laughs> yeah. But so a quick little thing about this is check this out. You don't want it to be uh, you want it to be level. You don't have to use that little needle valve meter thing. I just I want to make that thing look level, and I don't bend it right here. I grab it by the tab back here and bend it, and I don't bend right here. Okay, here we go. All righty. So here we all got the float level set. Look at it. Woo! All right. That guy there is who I actually uh, rent the building from. I worked for him for 20 years. He's an ace mechanic, but he retired a few years ago. And so that's how I took over and got to run this place myself. So a special thanks goes out to that guy. Uh, super nice dude. And so he's helping me today. As a matter of fact, got him working on me. He's actually, since he retired and I work here, he helps me. All right, so now we've got the float set like we want. It's set level. If you look, you can see that it's just sitting kind of level. That's all you really look for right there. You want to see it sitting level. And if it's down just a touch, if it's in a stock vehicle, so be it. It'll be fine. You'll have plenty of bowl in there and everything. But I, would, I want to get it level. So that's where you want it, right there. Level. So then the next thing we're going to do is start putting an accelerator pump in. And so... Uh, I'm sorry about the video. I use both hands here. I used a pair of needle, needle nose. I just, I put a little bit of a, uh, matter of fact, I just spit on my finger and wiped a little bit on the back side of that little piece there and just pulled it right on through. It's easier without the float, but I got ahead of myself, put the float in. And then the assembly procedure of this is very critical. You want this spring. Now I can't stress this enough. The, the big part of the spring, the big bottom part of the spring needs to go into this part of the carburetor. Big part of the spring goes towards the carburetor. And then you want to put your new accelerator pump in your little house in here. And it's real simple. It just it just comes out. And you just put your new one in. And then you line it all up and put the screws in. And you tighten the screws by hand very, very carefully. Here we are in the home stretch. We've got her all reassembled, ready to be reinstalled. And I did a quick little check to make sure I had all the accelerator pump stuff right. I'll stick this phone where you can see. And I've put some gas in the carburetor. I filled it up enough to where the accelerator pump would pick up. You can you can see my little squirters are squirting. So that okay. says it's working. So that is the rebuild procedure and explanation of some of the wonky stuff in a motorcraft two barrel carburetor. I hope it helps you get something old and back running again all by yourself. And if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to question them in the comments. I'll be glad to ask you or answer you in any form that I can. And I'll ask you a question too. What do you think? We'll trade questions. Anyways, it's got a new fuel filter. We properly set the float level. Got the accelerator pump working. We know we've got a new power valve. We've cleaned all the little portholes with our cable that we use. That's really good for that. Blew it out with air carefully. Brake cleaned and... Uh, once this is installed, we'll get it up to operation temperature, and then I'll find a screwdriver that'll fit underneath there because the customer will bring me the vehicle once he gets it on there. He likes to do things himself, too. So anyhow, I'll warm it up and readjust everything. If he happens to bring it to me, then I will show you me dialing in the mixture screws. If you're doing it yourself, you warm the vehicle up. If you can get it running and it runs okay, 
and if you if you if it's kind of running kind of crappy you can take a rag and lay over the top of it and if you're lean on your mixture screws your rag will constrict the airflow and allow more fuel to pull in and smooth out if you're rich and you lay your rag over it, it'll die down and cut off you're like okay okay i'm too rich so you get it fired back up and you want to turn those screws in and you'll do one at the time and you need to make sure the vehicle's up at operating temperature and you'll turn it in till you hear it make a difference and you'll open it back up until it smooths out and go past that point and starts to make a difference then you find the middle point and you'll hear that motor just smooth right on out thank you so much everybody for watching this whole video like i say any questions just throw them in the uh, comments and i'll be doing my best to answer them have a good rest of the week god is in control and uh, 45 one that's all i can say good deal i'm out